Welcome back to this instalment of Science Behind the Headlines, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we're talking drugs in sport. And to help me through the science uh, and the media around this topic, we've assembled a wonderful panel of Jason Mazanov, Robert Robergs, and Anna Kadeen. Can we get another round of applause for those, please? <laughs> don't forget to clap. Just because you're watching online doesn't mean that we don't appreciate the applause. Um, and we'd also like to remind you that uh, this conversation is going out on Twitter. And please use the hashtags RIOS and Drugs in Sport. RIOS, by the way, is A U S, R I A U S. Um, and apparently, we have a rather lively Twitter stream happening tonight, as we'll find out when we get to the questions. I actually want to turn to Annika to kick this half, half off. Um, as a, uh, involved in the media, uh, to, to service the media th uh, with science stories and observing the way that the media behaves. What's your take-home message on the way the, the role that the media has played with the whole coverage of drugs in sport? Well, it's a very interesting topic because you've basically combined science, which struggles to get into the media, that is, you know, one of our greatest aims, and sport, which doesn't struggle. Even on, even on a slow day, you've got sport. It doesn't matter what's happened, something's written something about what's coming up in three weeks' time. So this is the first time that you almost, well, not really the first, but one of the biggest times that it's been combined and you've had to combine talking about Essendon and, and Lance Armstrong and things like that in, in conjunction with talking about peptides and, and human growth hormones and other scientific aspects where in half the stories they're being written by sports reporters versus science reporters which don't really exist in um, today's uh, tabloid newspapers or health reporters. They, they do exist, thankfully. Um, so it, it created this interesting sort of scenario where it wasn't... It was still good coverage, though. The, the biggest issue we had was the, um, the Crime Commission report mentioned peptides, and they took, they took that word on and used it in their reporting. While it wasn't incorrect, it doesn't ex exactly explain peptides. I'm a journalist by training, not a scientist, so those guys would probably do a better job at explaining it, but they're also... Peptides are naturally occurring, just as they are, can be added to the body and, you know, induce human, the growth of human uh, hormones. So. We sort of had to put out and say, you know, wait a second, when you're constantly talking about peptides, maybe mention that there are also peptides in milk. And th th that kind of thing is important because you can't come out and say, we need to ban peptides because you can't tell an AFL footballer, don't have milk on your cereal in the morning. It's, you, it can't work. So they ha you have to be careful about that language. But it, that, in the sense, wasn't really the journalist's fault. It wasn't really the Crime Commission um, fault either. They're not exactly going to make sure that they've got that aspect of it right. But once you come out with something, it's very hard for the media to turn around and correct themselves. Just because once something's taken on, it's a lot easier to keep going down the path you started on. So that was sort of the only, the biggest thing we had. We just sort of had to come out and, and it sort of highlighted that aspect of, as I said, there's no science reporters in, in the papers anymore. So the sports reporter can't turn around and ask the science reporter, quick lesson, tell me in a sentence what a peptide is. They have health reporters, but in the case of News Limited, the biggest health reporter is Sue Dunleavy, who works in the network news desk. So, say in Adelaide, you know, they, they could call her up, but they're not just right behind them. They're not in the same office. It's harder to communicate with the reporters when they're based in one city and someone in another city is trying to write the story. And, and that brings in this, this idea of, you know, the reporting nowadays is just so different. A lot of people are general news reporters, and it's just harder for people to to stay in and, and report accurately. It's not their, own, it's not their fault, it's, it's the way the news has become, but it just highlights that it is really important to, to represent the science. Something that I found disturbing, uh, particularly in the Australian Crime Commission's report coverage, was the emergence of the sports scientist. I didn't realise that teams had their own sports scientists, and to a large extent, they were cast as, these are the evil drug pushers that are employed by football teams to, to, you know, our innocent football teams to pump them full of drugs. Exactly. And, and we actually had, on the Friday, when it all sort of blew up and, you know, you saw the headlines, darkest days in sport and all that kind of thing, we actually had a call from a media officer at, I think it was Griffith University in Queensland, who said, I've got a sports scientist here who really wants to come out and say, we're not all lethal. Like, stop using this term to describe half the people that they were describing as sports scientists aren't sports scientists. I can't tell you what they're actually trained in doing, but they're certainly not entitled to that, to that, to that label. And, and the sports scientists sort of, we had a couple that just wanted to come out and say, 
you know, we're not there just to pump drugs into footballers or, or swimmers. We're, you know, legitimate scientists. But in the case of those that, you know, it's like Stephen Dank, I don't actually know what his qualifications were, but, you know, there were people using the title that shouldn't have. And the media really caught on to that term and, you know, once they take something, they really run with it. But it did sort of create this example of, you know, so watch what you call someone. Well, as sports scientists, you too, I mean, well, you're obviously evil, Jason, but uh, <laughs> so moving on to Robert, uh, how did you feel about that turn in the reportage of the whole affair where there was the demonising of the sports <coughs> scientists? Yeah, it was very unfair. I mean, I think the ACC report, in hindsight, could have been written slightly differently. Um, and the comment is very correct. The, the established sports scientists uh, really weren't identified in the report. And, and Stephen Dank, you know, he's completing his PhD at the University of Sydney. He's not really recognised as a sports scientist, but he chooses to use the label because sports science is not a controlled, regulated industry. So anybody can predominantly use that label. The, the parent body of our field, which is Exercise and Sports Science Australia, is trying to to establish control in this arena, and they have the accredited sports scientist, of which Stephen isn't one, and there are several accredited sports scientists who work for, for football league teams uh, who do a tremendous job, and, and none of them have been targeted. So, you know, we, we, we got a bit of a, a broadside um, in that report based on the sports scientist. But it brings up another issue that I just want to tag onto this, and that is, Whose responsibility is it to check credentials of who they employ to handle professional athletes? And I, I just have a lot of discomfort about the club scenario in professional sport where they could probably hire some of these people without really caring much about their credentials and these things can happen. So um, I'm, I'm kind of paying attention to the media because I think there's going to be a lot come out over the next months that are really club based um, and to see who takes ownership of some of these decisions. Jason, did you feel dirty? Oh, I'm a psychologist. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Look, one of the things that was fascinating for me about watching what was happening is that have you ne ever noticed how it's always a few rogues and they bring it down for everyone? It's always, you know, and I remember in high school, um, the principal stood up and said, there's a few people out there ruining it for everybody. And it's seriously, the sports managers, the, the top of these sports clubs, like, come on. Have you ever noticed how it's never their fault? Okay, I mean, here we are, like, you, you, oh, it's rogue operators, but we have this massive army of support personnel to engage. I mean, Stephen Dank, he claims he's doing a PhD in biochemistry, right? You need a PhD in biochemistry to manage your supplements program now? Seriously? This is the level that sports reached. Okay, but what we see here is scapegoating. Whenever an athlete behaves badly, it's the athlete's fault, okay? The entire anti-doping system is set up to blame the athlete. Okay? It, the athlete is it's a strict liability offence, there are drugs in your system, you did it, you're out. Okay? Even though we know most athletes, and I apologise to the athletes out there, but athletes need, you need a PhD in biochemistry to manage a supplement program and we're expecting athletes to manage their own supplement program and know what's going into their body. Most of the time they don't even know what's in the supplements because they're contaminated. They have all sorts of things in them because it's not a regulated industry. So we're scapegoating them. We're scapegoating sports scientists. The attention has just shifted from athletes now to sports scientists. But who are the people in the background who are actually running this stuff? Okay. So I want what I really want to see. I want to see um, Dimitri step up, take responsibility. I want to see the guys at the top of sport step up and say, "This is how we have made our sports complicit in this. This is what we're doing to try and fix the problem." Instead of just pointing the finger and saying, "You're a rogue operator. You're the problem." I was on a, a TV program uh, that was aired a couple of weeks ago, and the whole program appeared to be around exonerating the AFL because of a few rogue elements that were making it bad for everybody else. Now, seriously, it just doesn't work like that. Sorry, rant over. No, no, we <laughs> should have brought the soapbox out tonight. Um, <laughs> another aspect, though, of the whole reporting of uh, particularly the... Uh, the uh, ACC report, but, al but also in Lance Armstrong, was the role that the media, they seem to have appointed themselves policemen in the whole role. Uh, they, 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 the media as a whole have gone beyond simply reporting what's going on. I feel like that's not new for the media, though. <laughs> no, but, but in this situation, 
it, have they overstepped the mark? Are they doing more than they really ought to be doing? I, feel, oh, I almost want to be an advocate for them in the sense that the ACC came out with a report and said, we've got this X number of teams in the NRL, we've got this X number of teams in the AFL. You've got 18 teams in the AFL. I don't follow the NRL, so I'm not entirely sure how many there are on that side, but there's, I don't know, let's say 15. It's, it's almost like saying, I'm just going to come out and say, one person in this room has done something illegal. I'm not going to tell you which one, but you can all now report on that little sentence that I've just... It's, see, you, you create this air of that the entire... like And, and as um, Jason spoke to that, it probably is most of the AFL that is engaging in these activities, but they were just so sketchy about it in the sense that the media didn't have a lot to go on, but they still wanted to report everything that they possibly could, which the media always does. They want to get you know, what they think out there. So, I don't know, I, I just have to... I, it started with the ACC, so I always just want to go back to that report. And, and I know why they came out and, and released the report, because they then began more in their investigations, but they almost came at it halfway, and the media's not very good at halfway points. They want end points. The, the good news is there is some science... Well, sociology, so I don't know if we can call it science. Um, <laughs> There is some science around this. Uh, there's a, a fellow, uh, Safira Fala, uh, from the US, who actually uh, seconded themselves to be a sports journalist for a little while and found out just the sports journalists don't have time to write anything because they're chasing copy all the time. And as a result, they actually can't get into any of the detail, any of the depths. And that's why they rely very heavily on the WADA press releases and the ASADA press releases. And they'll just churn them forward, like, hey, because it's easy copy, I can get it out. And so when something like this comes up, the journalists actually have to sort of, OK, I now actually have to get in my head into this. And when I talk to journalists, sort of one of the things I say to them, do you understand what a drug test is in sport? And they look at me and what? In a, a drug test is you are stripped from the nipple to the knee and someone watches urine come out of your body. Now, they have to do that to make sure that you haven't got a bladder shoved up your anus, OK, or you haven't got a prosthetic penis or something like that. Now, add to this a layer of complication and this is happening to a colleague of mine at work. Imagine you've got a 12-year-old girl who is now forced to go through this for the sake of drug-free sport. Now, when you say that to a journalist, pretty much the reaction is like, what? I didn't realise that's the price of drug-free sport. And they start reassessing. It doesn't usually come out in the copy because it's, sort of, it's a bit too, perhaps, contentious for their, their editors. But when the journalists don't understand what the process is, it's hard for everyone else to understand what's going on. Our last event here was uh, a book launch for Fred Watson's uh, stargazing book. And I was hoping we could get through tonight without mentioning Uranus, but, you know. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, uh, something else that was telling, too, was that Lance Armstrong, when he went to make his confession, went to Oprah Winfrey rather than to, uh, what's his name, David Walsh, who's a reporter who actually understands the issues. Um, uh, Tyler Hamilton went on to the 7.30 report. You know, I mean, these don't seem to be the best platforms to explain the nuts and bolts of what you're doing. They seem to be platforms where you can get the most exposure and popularity. Well, and with um, Oprah, it was also a case of she's, she's kind and friendly. She's, she, you know, I'm sure she can get out and be mean if she wants to be, but when you watch her interview, she's there to be warm and friendly and, and coach you into just so revealing you your it's deepest darkest secrets. So sugarcoating the fact that yeah, he was it, cheating and bullying. Exactly. And you, you don't put him in front of a, of a reporter who, you know, breaks down, investigates hard-hitting news. You want the nice, fluffy Oprah who can... But didn't that also speak, <laughs> though, to the circus of the whole thing oh, exactly. rather than yeah. the straight reporting? It was, it was his... Like, he controlled the situation. It, it wasn't that someone suddenly knocked him up at his front door and made him reveal all... His people put it all together and they chose Oprah for a specific reason. Well, yeah, and don't, don't forget that Oprah was one of Lance's main supporters during Lance's rehab from drugs, I mean, from his testicular cancer, um, <laughs> which, was also, which also involved drugs. <laughs> but um, so Oprah's had a vested interest in Lance for a long time um, and she really pushed the Live Strong um, mm. movement. So, you know, she, she's a kind of a friend. So, yeah, it just adds to the to the lack of clarity as to yeah, that connection. All right, it's time to go to audience questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll get a microphone over to you. Whilst the microphone's on its way, I'll throw a question into the mix uh, that's come in on Twitter. Uh, and that was uh, concerning um, uh, drugs are a factor separating 
some amateur athletes from the elite level. Um, how far are we seeing drugs bleeding down into the amateur levels? I mean, you know, we, we all see the guys who are obviously not professional, but are obviously pumped up to the eyeballs, eyeballs on roid rage coming out of the gym. Um, are we seeing drug abuse in amateur sport? Um, we'd love to be able to answer that question, but no one will fund the research. Um, what we know anecdotally is, um, for example, you'll see a lot, of, a lot of boys going for rugby union, for example. Um, you hear anecdotal stories, these guys loading up on protein, getting to ridiculous weights for their age in the hope that they'll get in. Um, I've heard uh, stories in the, the local AFL, you know, guys will run onto the field with a handful of caffeine tablets, wash it down with a, a high energy caffeine drink and then play and they're so wide on caffeine they can't catch the ball. I um, hope they've got some vodka mixed in with that lot. No, no, that would, that would impair their performance. Oh, okay. Right. Um, the one which terrifies me the most, though, is the uh, stories I've heard. Uh, one which really knocked me for six was the under-12 netball team where the coach was making sure that the girls had their, their beta agonist, their, their, their inhaler, asthma inhaler, before the game. Um, so to suggest that this is a men's-only issue and to suggest that this is an elite-only issue is naive. It's happening at all levels of sport. Uh, Australia, like most societies around the world, is a pill-popping, performance-enhancing culture. I mean, it's what we do. Um, we take pills for all sorts of things, to feel better from colds. Uh, most people consume caffeine to get them going in the morning and so on. So there is a strong element of that, I think, in Australian culture. You fill me with such joy. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, he, here's, a, here's another more sad uh, tale to tell. I, mean, I was involved in a similar uh, show in the US you know, several years ago. And it was about a high school student who was taking testosterone uh, supplementation. And one of the side effects of testosterone abuse is you know, aggression as well as depression. And he committed suicide. And there's a growing number of high school aged children, both in the US and probably Australia, who are taking steroids, not for a sports related issue, but to make themselves look better in a world where looks apparently is more important than what you think. Um, and so that's a whole other dimension of, of, of this uh, abuse problem. Um, and yeah, in this circumstance, it was an incredibly sad um, end result. Tragic. We do have a question from the floor. Uh, speaking of women, are we, uh, do we benefit more from anabolic steroids and testosterone and all of those things because we have such tiny amounts in our bodies? And um, do you recommend it? to heal from all sorts of injuries, but not um, to build up your muscles, just to heal quicker. We were talking about a similar topic to this during break, and yeah, there are, certain, there, there are certainly medical uses for um, steroid supplementation. I mean, and that, that's pretty well established. And so, um, but I'm not qualified to talk about that. I mean, you need to talk to a physician and, and probably an endocrinologist about those details, but certainly those, those um, prescription modalities exist for certain individuals. Um, now, females, I mean, yes, you do have a small amount of testosterone, just like we men have a small amount of estrogen, and women certainly benefit in terms of quote unquote benefit from muscle mass perspective if they take anabolic steroids. Um, whether that's recommended for a normal woman to, to do that is a whole other thing. Um, my bias would be to certainly say no, but there are women bodybuilders who do it and abuse it, and we see the end results um, in the commercial bodybuilding circuits. Um, so, yeah, hard, hard to give you any definitives there from, from my perspective and qualifications. It also raises a really good point, which I'm very passionate about, is that uh, we talk about doping in the Masters games. And when you've got people on rejuvenation therapy in the Masters Games, they're taking EPO, human growth hormone, and anabolic steroids, it's probably supervised by their physician. Uh, is that considered cheating? And they do have anti-doping at the Masters Games. So it does raise a whole other kettle of fish when you start talking about that this is not an elite sport problem, but it's non-elite, it's Masters, it's semi-professional, and so on. Question down the front. During the break, some of us were talking about the dream and how we seem to live in a world where everything's got to be just this wonderful dream way. We have, um, you know, enhanced sports people. We, we sack coaches because their team's not top. Well, unfortunately, not every team can be top, and there seems to be this lack of reality. 
we have, you know, models who are, are, are made airbrushed and have ribs removed and so on. And what you've talked about in terms of this is more a nightmare for those involved. And I'm just wondering if there is any hope. Is this, has it got to the stage where it has become so unreal, where the public has expected far too much and lost all touch with the reality and that we need to go right back to square one and I'm just wondering if you want your son to have as his heroes sporting people or whether you'd rather have them as scientists and get on with a real life. <laughs> <laughs> um, who do I want my son's heroes to be? Well, I mean, that, that's ultimately for him, I hope. Um, the question of role modelling is, is a difficult one, but I mean, we don't demand the same behavioural standards of our, our politicians, and arguably they're the stronger role models um, in our society. Oh, I hope not. Yeah, well. <laughs> Please God. But um, do we expect perfection? Look, I think that th one of my, my catchphrases on this topic is that we have a two-dimensional sanitised view of sport. When you pull back the veil and you look at sports production, wow, this is what it really is. I think the public's expectations are unrealistic in the sense that they don't get what actually goes on. Now, once we see it, we have a choice. We can stop consuming these versions of sport or we can keep going because if, if we consume it, we watch it, we buy it, then they're going to keep producing it. So, you know, here, we, here is the reality writ large right in front of us. What are we going to do as a society about this? And at the moment, it's anti-doping. I'd like to see us move to a more humane model, if I can call it that way, a model which is based on science, something which actually says the evidence points to this approach being better than that approach. Unfortunately, with anti-doping, we have never been allowed to find out what any alternative approach might look like because with me saying things against anti-doping, I actually risk being sanctioned and not being able to go to sport because I am contradicting the goals of anti-doping. It is written into the code. Can you foresee the uh, same way that in, in food production we now have organic and locally grown lines, um, that we actually have, you know, uh, the, the, the drug-free league? But then you'd have a drug league. You, you had to yeah, get it for a separate tiered system. Then you've got system. the dope league. But, but <laughs> let, let's learn from that, shall we, right? So let's talk about organic farming and let's talk about cage-free eggs, right? This is really not really going off the, the plot here, right? Cage-free eggs have now become Right, which the chicken has maybe four inches more room than maybe in a cage. You know, that's now cage free. They're not in a cage, but they're still cramped. And organic farming has become not what it was 30 years ago because of all these commercial pressures. So if our so-called improved agriculture has succumbed to all the forces of economics about farming, you know, the same thing's just happening to sports. So, you know, Whatever, whatever you want to label the better practice, it's going to be morphed to be profitable, and that to me is a problem, as we've talked about before. If you go to a laissez-faire model, the economics will tell you what will emerge. And when I've run the thought experiment, no matter what happens in sport, you always end up with drugs in it. You can't get away from it. So what you have to do then is find out the right way to regulate it, because it has to be controlled for the reasons I articulated earlier. So. You know, this idea of a drug-free, like, you know, it just, it, it, it's a panacea. It doesn't exist. We had a, 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 an entertaining little thought experiment just before coming on this evening of, um, let's just name a couple of sports and you guys can tell me what drugs are likely to be being used there. Um, <laughs> and, and the one that, that, that springs to mind straight off the, uh, the cuff is dressage. Um, <laughs> Like what drugs? And when I when I brought it up, they said that there probably are drugs. And what were they? Uh, beta blockers. <coughs> beta blockers. Why, yeah. why would you have beta blockers? Well, would you give them to the, the rider or the horse? No, the, the rider probably. Right. Oh, maybe yeah. the audience. Oh, yeah, all the audience. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they might need stimulants in the audience. But yeah, just to calm just to calm the rider down. So in archery, I mean, they've been queried about using beta blockers to to calm the athlete down. So I mean. There are horses for courses and there are drugs for different sports. And yeah, in some sports they'll need a stimulant, other sports would need a, a depressant or a calming agent. Perhaps. You're even saying that in golf, um, Tiger Woods and well, some others have had eye surgery to improve their <coughs> eyesight. Well, I was saying earlier that if I was to pick one sport that has been a holy grail of no one would ever think there could be supplement abuse in, it would now be golf because the golfer has become 
more of an athlete than they were you know, 20 years ago. So, um, and where there's money, there's the incentive to perhaps um, get stronger. And, and now, you know, golf has become a more athletic game than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And they're training more, they're, they're lifting weights. Uh, so it wouldn't and surprise me. Walking between me. holes instead of walking taking those little buttons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you still have to walk <laughs> between holes. So I mean, what about chess? What, oh. are, what are they taking there? Okay, let, let me. Chess yeah. has an Viagra. Anti, no, it, it has an anti-doping code because they really? wanted to legitimate themselves as a sport. <laughs> this is one of the ways. That was that the chess way they is, went about it. Yes, yeah, it's one of the ways that they've gone about it, and they do comply with the world anti-doping code. One of the so some of the drugs that you might Excuse use there. Excuse me, Mr. Kasparov. Can you pee in this, please? <laughs> um, methylphenidate, and modafinil. Are two drugs, so narcolepsy and um, attention deficit disorder drugs that increase focus and concentration. So, they, and they are actually banned under the World Anti-Doping Code um, for all sports in competition, I think, isn't it? I've strayed into dangerous grounds here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Please, sir, could you help me out with your question? <laughs> the Americans took a few years of gathering research against Lance Armstrong and brought in all these people ACC seems to be trying to do the same trick, but yet the media just says, why are you saying all of the Australian sport's terrible and they're just following that type of example. Then we've got, uh, they came out the other day, we've got 180 million of government funding. If you don't improve your sports results, we'll be reducing your budget by 20%, which is sort of saying, going to Tyler Hamilton, that to be competitive you have to take drugs. And then going on what Tyler said, that if you weren't if you wanted to be in the top half of the pack, you had to be on drugs. But we've only had two people from Elite Cycling who were coaches come out and say that they're on drugs and resign. Now surely there's more investigations to go. So it covers media, psychology, and mm. physiology. Mm. You, you skipped the paleontology, but that was probably wise. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure, we can get dinosaurs in there. So, so yeah, you, you, uh, and the refrain this evening has been that uh, you'd like to do more research, but you're not allowed to do it. But surely more investigations need to be done. Yeah, I and mean, they do. Um, look, the. the John Fay, president of the World Anti-Doping Agency and the guy who brought us the Sydney Olympics, um, has said, the war on drugs in sport cannot be won. You cannot win it, and you cannot win it with drug testing. Drug testing manifestly has failed. In Australia, the prevalence rate according to the drug testing is about a half a percent of all tests. Problem is, is that we don't know. When I asked WADA, um, how many people have you tested? And they said, we don't know. They can tell us how many tests they've conducted, but they can't tell us how many people that they've, they've tested. The best estimates that we see, like, so the anecdotal estimates range from 2%, which is the WADA official rate, to 95%, which basically means we have no idea. Um, there is no reliable epidemiology. We can't get a reliable epidemiology. The best estimates I've seen put it at somewhere between 5 and 10%, probably 8%. Uh, who are using the top end of drugs, but as I've said before, that doesn't capture anybody else in the non-elite, the masters or anything else. So realistically, we actually have no idea how many people are using. Um, we never will know. We can't win the war. Uh, so you've got to ask the question, like you say, I mean, you know, we, we're forcing people to try and get performance, but we're denying them certain things and we want them to do this, and there seems to be an awful lot of contradiction in there. And that's where I'd like to see us go back and rethink sport. So we had the, the Crawford review of the AIS, uh, sort of Sport in Australia, which said, you know, abandon the top model, stop funding the elite, go for participatory sport, and you'll have a much better outcome from it. And then John Coates came in and convinced the government to give even more money to the Olympics. So there's lots of vested interests at play here, and they're not necessarily acting in the interests of public health, of what we should be doing to make sport drug free, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, really, there is a lot going on, as you've identified. Um, another question in here from Twitter, uh, is the AFL's drugs three strike policy ineffective? Shouldn't players have repercussions after one positive test? It's funny they should ask that because I literally asked yeah. Jason that before we started tonight's presentation. From, from my perspective as an observer, I found it strange, but Jason, go on, because after you told me, I was actually quite okay. understanding of it. Um, the AFL illicit drug policy is about treatment. 
okay, let's prioritise athlete health and welfare. From my point of view, it's actually progressive. It's actually what the evidence says. Medical evidence says harm minimisation approaches where you get an athlete and you treat them is a good thing. So let's take the archetypal case, Ben Cousins. If you take Ben Cousins away from the AFL, away from all the support he's ever known, the only life he's ever known, and he's trying to recover from drugs and he's having a hard time of it, what do you think's going to happen to the guy? He's going to bomb out pretty big. So what you need to do is keep him in the fold to help him get over it. The AFL has a responsibility and took that responsibility to help Ben Cousins get through that part of his life. He came back, he played a few more seasons, he finished. What happens after that is up to Ben. Okay? He's, not a, he's a smart guy, I mean, he'll, he'll figure it out. Um, but the key here is that the AFL policy actually does follow best medical practice and they're required to do something else for all the other drugs because of the anti-doping code. So harm minimisation, as practised by the AFL, from my point of view, is a great thing. And we should, look, from my, one of the things I say they probably could tweak, if you take drugs, then you are suspended from playing until you can prove to us that you are not taking drugs. And do it that way instead of banning people for two years, cutting them off from their funding, cutting them off from the people that they know and love. So, I mean, they're, they could probably tweak the policy, but I think it's the right way to, to go about doing it. There's another discussion we had earlier um, that uh, I'm actually dying to unwrap because uh, you, you asked me to, to bring it up here, and that is why are, why are we testing for marijuana as a performance-enhancing drugs when... I shouldn't say from personal experience, but I can't imagine that after pulling a few bongs that you'd want to go out and even play a game of football, <laughs> let alone that it would make you play better. Do you want to talk uh, about uh, marijuana? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, more, more, it's more rock no, 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 is it? I'll, I'll, I'll just give, it, give you a break and the audience a break from you. Um, <laughs> just, oh, <laughs> no, it's a good thing. Community <laughs> service. That, yeah. was a, that was a positive statement. Um, all right, so where were we? Marijuana. Um, just remember that the, the history of um, testing for, for drugs in sport began with a, um, a very altruistic, positive rationale in that we were trying to protect the athlete from potential harm from these drugs. So the history, I think, back to marijuana is, is kind of simple. It's that, well, it's something that they shouldn't be taking anyway, and that's obviously debatable depending upon where you come from, what your beliefs are. But, um, but there's potential harm. And so a lot of the, the testing is based upon the, the mindset that you know, what's potentially harmful, we also need to test. It's not just about performance improvement. You know, there's, there's a historical development in drug testing that is also about protecting um, the athlete. And this goes to the very essential point, which should this be about drugs or should it be about performance enhancement? Mm. So if it's about drugs, there is a legitimate case to be made for banning marijuana. Um, and a, a colleague of mine, Rich Hildebrand, has written on this. And uh, we've also got a, a special issue of my journal coming out looking at this particular point. One of the things that surprised me about Rich's argument was he said, you know, if, if you've got a gymnast, smokes a bit of dope, literally dope, before they go out on the bars and then they lack of coordination, marijuana affects coordination, they wrap their, their neck on the bar because they smoke marijuana. Now I as a manager um, have a responsibility to my employee to make sure that they have as safe a workplace as I can make. So that legitimates why we might ban marijuana. Now some of my, uh, my, my more experienced colleagues uh, in other parts of the anti-doping world, the anti-doping research world, assure me that marijuana can be performance enhancing, especially with snowboarding um, and mountain biking. So they argue that, that it's essential, actually, to perform in those two spaces. So it, what it does is it just goes to show how vapid the line about what is considered performance enhancing has become. Marijuana is performance enhancing, guys. You watch it. I think we'll go to another question from the floor. <laughs> uh, up the back there. All right, so this is sort of bouncing off of two things that were said. Number one, that it can't be beat. Number two, in that if you don't take these, you might come out of the sport a wreck and not be able to walk properly anymore, right? Um, so we're arguing more for just a mindset change or like an exclusion change in that the public might have to turn around and go, okay, well, if I want my son to grow up to be that or if I myself want to grow up to be that, then I might have to accept that I might have to push my body further than it's naturally made to go. And it might take away a little bit of the romanticism or a little bit of like, oh, little Timmy's going to grow up to be an AFL pro. Um, but at the same point in time, like, isn't that 
the number one step that would number one that, that would make this I don't know, make us be able to accept this and also make it come out in the open so it can be regulated and the athletes can be safe and we can take better care of them. Yes. <laughs> this actually touches on something um, that in my time uh, at the ABC as a science reporter, we, we did the various drugs in sport stories. Uh, I met a number of, of um, high performance uh, athletes in a number of different codes and one way or another, if you ask them the question, if you could get away with it, would you take X? They would say yes. There was no hesitation, there was no thought. They would take anything. So why don't we just open the, you know, let, let them well, go. But where, you've got to set a limit though. Well, not a limit, but well, this is my question because I have no idea where it would end up. If you did regulate it, you, wouldn't you not have to set at a certain point, okay, we'll regulate it because we'll allow you to take X amount of X then there's still a level in which to push past. So how do you, uh, actually, uh, my honest question is, how do you regulate it? Do you allow them to take a certain amount? Do you just let it free for all and say, do whatever you like, and we'll just know that it's happening? Or like, where does the regulation come about? Well, I want to address the part of the question that, that's about recovery and, and the issue about protecting the athlete. I mean, and the, and the best example of this strange scenario in my mind is the, the state of origin games in the, in the uh, rugby league, and last year we had some players playing, you know, three games in a week and a half, um, and some of them were able to do it, and some of those players are now on a suspicion of, of taking um, anabolic peptides, primarily because they improved recovery. Uh, so, so this is just really interesting because we're we're, we're talking about um, perhaps supplementation on a performance side, and then there's also the recovery and the athletic or the athlete well-being side, that it just it makes the, the, the line more grey and more broad, and it's difficult. And it's difficult. I mean, it, it comes back to that very important question about um, you're still constructing this as a performance enhancement issue. What I would love to see is this. I think the notion of performance enhancement is just the wrong way to think about the role of drugs in sport. We need to rethink the role of drugs in sport so that it's not about ooh, who's cheating and how much did you take and how much performance enhancing effect. It's like, no, you misuse, you abuse this drug, it'll kill you. And that's the threshold we're going to use. We've, we've talked about what safe levels of hematocrit are for a long time now. And we fairly much have a good idea about, at this point, your blood becomes too thick and you're at risk of having a heart attack in your sleep and dying. So we've got some good sensitive information around this. We can use that. And I think that if we changed it to health, we'd actually have a lot more compliance. I'm pretty sure athletes would say, I'm interested in making sure I don't die because of my drug use. Really, take a blood sample, take a urine sample, I'm happy to be part of this. So that's part of, I guess, the way I see it. We have a, another question down the front here. Just a comment and a question, a quick comment. We mentioned earlier something about uh, intravenous rehydration of, of athletes, mm -hmm. uh, not banned under the wider code. Interestingly enough, the AFL actually banned it because they deemed it not a good look amongst their players, so there's one. Mm. But my question is more about, we've, we've put Lance Armstrong up a fair bit tonight. He's a, what we would call a fallen hero. Um, what impact do you think this is having on people's thoughts about their past heroes? Because at the moment we're talking about athletes that have excelled yeah. at their sports and there's suddenly suspicion about their performance, and yet we look at past heroes like the Miguel and Geraint in cycling, the Sergei Budkas of this world, what impact do you think it's having on people's thoughts on those people in the past? Yeah, what was Don Bradman on? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, it's a good point. Well, yeah, clearly it wasn't enough, otherwise he would have made that final 100, and it would have been fun. <laughs> um, but the, because you raised the point earlier on that you, you twigged that there was something going on with Armstrong because of his performance, but how far back do you have to go before performances weren't that unusual to raise suspicion. So that we're, we're talking about a time when there wasn't... Uh, well, how long have we known hormones. about human growth hormones and all that stuff? Couldn't you go from that point? Obviously, someone has to know about it to know that it's going to help the athlete. Well, Isn't there a point at which we didn't have any... I mean, if you, want to blame, oh, <laughs> if you want to blame a sociological shift, it's all about bodybuilding, right? I mean, bodybuilding started the whole movement about changing the function and, and look of the human body. But... But to me, the question is, is more sociological, and it really suits James. But I mean, the issue is why do we always have our heroes be sportsmen and women? In, in Australia, we have that sociological um, trait where we do that, 
And I just want to make one comment here. I mean, every year, and it's only once a year, we have the Australian of the Year. And you'll, you learn about Australians who do amazing things, far more amazing than sports men and women do. And as an exercise physiologist, that's a major statement for me to make. But why, why don't we have an Australian of the Year every week or every month? Right? Why do we just wait once a year to tell Australia what other people are doing that impacts so many more people in so many more positive ways? Um, and so, you know, sociologically, yeah, let's just have a look at who we put up on our, on our um, idol fridge or our idol um, mantle. And, um, it, it really forces us to take a look at ourselves, I think. Well, we do, and I guess the question that I'm asking is why do we keep doing that when there are so many more Australians who do far more meaningful things and we just don't get exposed to that? And, of course, I mean, I hate to say it, but it comes back to money, doesn't it? The money is driving the sports industry and there's a lot of money in putting people up there on those pedestals and they're the people who get the commercial contracts and you know, why can't a Nobel laureate sell Wheaties and Wheat Bix and Vegemite? I mean, I'll give Brian Schmidt a call. Oh, that's I'm, sure. Sure <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that what he needs is a sponsorship from Kellogg's. So yeah. he, he'll like that. Uh, look, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're, we're flush out of time. It's been a, a fascinating uh, discussion. Before we go any further, let's have a big round of applause and join in at home. Thank you.